Welcome to Let's Chat About, the free monthly webinar series hosted by Sophia Sees Hope. We've developed the series with those living with Leber congenital amaurosis and inherited retinal diseases in mind, but it is open to anyone who is interested in what's happening in our communities. My name is Alyssa Bass, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Sophia Sees Hope. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series, AGTC, Dominion Energy, Janssen, Mira GTX, Procure, and Spark Therapeutics. We could not provide programs such as these without their support. A few housekeeping items. This session will last about 45 minutes, maybe an hour. Your microphones have been muted and your cameras are off. We have turned off the chat function. You can submit questions through the Q&A. And we did collect questions in advance during registration. So we will take those first and then we'll take any questions that come in during the webinar. We are recording this session and afterwards we will post it on our YouTube channel and we will send the link out to all the participants. It's my pleasure today to welcome two incredible supporters of and advocates for Sophia Sees Hope, Tammy Morehouse and Jack McCormick. Tammy made research history when at age 44, she participated in a clinical trial for gene therapy for LCA2 RPE65. Ultimately, Spark Therapeutics developed the drug that was marketed as Luxturna following Federal Drug Administration approval in December 2017. Tammy volunteers in Sophia Sees Hope's Family Connections Program, which connects people within the LCA community to share information and provide support. She is also a Sophia Sees Hope ambassador. Our ambassadors give encouragement to Libra congenital amaurosis patients and caregivers. They attend conferences, keep up with research, and share their stories and experiences to help others. Tammy and her husband, Mike, who is also an ambassador, live in Ashtabula, Ohio, and she works as an information and referral specialist for 211 for Ashtabula County. She and Mike represented Sophia Sees Hope at the Foundation Fighting Blindness Visions 2018 conference in San Diego. She served as a fantastic panelist at our LCA family conferences in 2018 in Mystic, Connecticut, and again in 2019 in Philadelphia. And she frequently talks privately with LCA patients and their families about living with an IRD. Jack is from Ontario, Canada, and he graduated from Wilford Laurier University in Waterloo in 2018. Diagnosed with LCA2 due to a mutation in his RP65 gene, Jack is a passionate advocate for inclusion and accessibility on all fronts. He initially tried to hide his blindness, but all that ended when he got Jake, his beloved guide dog. And we actually have an update coming later. In college, he founded Eye to Eye, a student club whose goal is to eliminate stigma associated with vision impairments. He volunteers with Fighting Blindness Canada, including working on their 2018 Young Leaders Summit. Jake retired in 2020, and Jack has a new guide dog named Baloo. Jack works in human resources for a software company, is board vice chair of the CNIB ONQC, and serves on the Metrolinx Accessibility Committee. In 2021, he launched Lights with Jack McCormick, a podcast which he describes as his attempt to unlock the secrets to living a more meaningful and fulfilling life so that together we can find the lights in our life. Through his podcast, he connects with business leaders, personal development experts, and inspiring people with stories to tell. He is also a Sophia Sees Hope ambassador, and he writes a column in our quarterly newsletter about navigating young adulthood with vision loss. Please join me in welcoming Tammy and Jack. So today's topic for our webinar is self-advocacy. And that's certainly a cornerstone of Sophia Sees Hope and why we were founded and, and what our purpose is. But self-advocacy is a very personal thing. So I would love to hear from the two of you what self-advocacy means to you. Tammy, let's start with you. Well, it hasn't been all that long ago um, that I learned the true meaning of a self-advocacy because I really never wanted any part of it. <laughs> um, I related to uh, my, my vision problems. Um, it took a very, very long time for me to reach out to people and to speak up um, when I had particular needs or I needed some assistance. I was somebody who I didn't wanna talk about my blindness to a lot of people. I 
and just kind of lived my life doing whatever I could, just managing through whatever barriers got in my way in one way or another. Um, just getting through, I used to kind of just joke and say, yeah, I'm just kind of bumping along, doing whatever I do. And it always worked. I always managed to do very well for myself, I think. But then I got into a point in life, uh, actually, I lost a very beloved longtime job I had for 18 years. And I lost that job to uh, budget cuts. So I found myself in a position where, oh my gosh, you know, I need to find a new job. And I knew that I really needed to update my skills. So that was like the first little bridge where, okay, I need to seek out some assistance. I need to get some support and some information, some education so I can market myself better. And when I started doing that, I, I got a, a glimpse of just how beneficial it is and how helpful it is to reach out and ask for that help. Um, I just got overwhelming responses from people that I was asking for help for. And, you know, through um, a lot, well, it took a lot of time, a lot of patience, but I was a, able to pick up another job um, that I have. I've been at my current job for about the last two years. And, um, you know, not only did I, all the people who were helping me and training me, giving me education, helping me learn how to use the JAWS software, screen reading software. Um, I found people that I, I work with, you know, once I started opening up a little bit about my blindness, they also opened up about a, a lot of their personal things. I, and I realized not, you know, everybody has something. So I just became more and more comfortable with being able to ask for assistance um, because I realized I'm not the only one who needs help sometimes. Um, and being able to do that and to speak up for myself and talk about whatever I might need assistance with has changed my life tremendously. Um, I am now at this point in my life much more functional. I am much more successful in my career. I feel much more independent and an awful lot less frustrated. Um, it was just really literally an eye-opening experience for me and I can't believe how much it has changed my life. The only problem, the only thing that I really regret is that I didn't let myself ask for that assistance and speak up before I did. I wasted a lot of time. And I, I just have this feeling, this overall um, feeling in life, you know, that I just don't have to worry so much um, about the barriers that I come across because I know now how to ask for assistance and, and it just doesn't have to be such the battle. So it's just being able to do that, like I said in the beginning of, of my little blurb here, you know, it's just an amazing tool for me. And I'm just so glad that I've been able to, to do that for myself. And not only does it help me, but it's helped others around me, you know, the people that I work with, my employers, even my family. It's just I made a huge change for me. Wow, that's so great to hear. I'm, I just think back to when we first met you in 2017 and, and um, what confidence you, you have now when you speak to, to people and, and in front of people, I mean, to present at a conference is intimidating to, you know, seasoned, <laughs> it is. seasoned public speakers. And, um, yeah. and it, we're so appreciative of it. That's just such a great, such a great story. Jack, how about you? What does self-advocacy mean to you? Yeah, before I answer that question, I'm going to apologize if you hear a dog barking in the background. It's my neighbors and it's been going on and off since the moment we started this webinar. Um, but in terms of self, uh, self, self advocacy, I really think it's about getting what you need so that you can empower yourself. Um, I think the self advocacy is something that applies in so many different situations from uh, people with vision loss who are still in school, who are in the workforce, who are just on the street and can't find the right building because, you know, myself, you know, I can't see the signs uh, for buildings, um, things like that. Um, Self-advocacy is about getting the tools you need so that you can reach your maximum potential. Um, I think that oftentimes people 
who live with vision loss um, or any type of disability for that matter feel like advocating for themselves and asking for those supports as, as Tammy described, view it as something that is like almost looking at it as identifying themselves as someone who's not able. But what you're doing by being a good self-advocate is really allowing yourself to be fully able to fully contribute to get all the information you need. Um, and, and it's something that if you don't self-advocate, you're not going to live as full a life as you can. And it's, it's a muscle that I found I need to practice all the time. And, you know, in, in some circumstances, I feel much more comfortable self-advocating than others. Um, you know, myself working in human resources, I feel very confident speaking and self-advocating uh, at work. Um, however, if, you know, I, the example I'll go back to asking a stranger on the street, hey, is this the barber shop uh, right here? Um, I, I feel a little bit more awkward because I don't know how that person on the street might react. I remember once I was uh, on vacation in Vancouver uh, by myself and uh, Vancouver is on the far west coast of Canada. Um, and I was had a tour booked, a, a guided tour, and I needed to get to a specific location. And I, I stopped and uh, I was like, excuse me, sir, uh, to a person I could see moving by me. And I said, you know, is such and I was supposed to say is such and such location down this way. And he started to say, I don't have spare change. And I was like, no, 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 I, I need a direction to where I'm going. Like, I, I can't, I don't imagine I look that disheveled, but, um, so, but by practicing, you start to realize that more people are going to be helpful. You're not going to have very many weird, uncomfortable situations like that. And you're going to meet a lot of really fantastic people who are so open to, to assist. Yeah, that's, um, I'm sure you looked just fine that day. <laughs> Um, thank you. So Jack, in the in the bio that I shared earlier, and you have written about this for Sophia Sees Hope, and you've talked about it with us in the video that, that we have um, that stars you, uh, you spend a long time trying to hide your vision loss. Um, talk about what was behind that and and how and how you changed and, and evolved and came around to um, to being more public? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think it's, it's a really important one. Um, for myself, uh, through much of my childhood and, you know, into, uh, you know, moving away from my family to go to university, I could see well enough that I could fake it in most situations. I would still, you know, occasionally bump into something or, Oftentimes, I would move my head up and down to try and focus on something. Uh, so, I, so I had a few like uh, quirks, I guess, is the best way to put it, that if you were looking closely, you could identify me as someone with vision loss, but the average person wouldn't be able to recognize that. And so because I was able to hide it, I chose to hide it because I found it to be much easier just to... Uh, be and not have to go through the effort of explaining. But what ended up happening as a result is because I didn't, I wasn't upfront with people and I didn't have sort of the awkwardness of sharing my vision loss. Uh, when I first met someone, I found myself constantly trying to hide it. And I found myself always focusing on trying to hide my vision loss. And I felt shameful of my vision loss because I was hiding it. And I didn't feel like I could truly be me. And I was so focused on hiding something that was part of me that I couldn't enjoy experiences to their fullest. And so what really changed for me um, was when I got my guide dog. I went from being someone who you know could hide it to I've got this big black dog who's with me 24 seven that wears a harness that identifies him as a guide dog, which then identifies me as someone with a visual impairment. And so I couldn't hide it. And just by having that guide dog, everyone just understands, oh, this guy can't see. 
the assumption ended up usually being, oh, this guy can't see anything, um, even though I can still see uh, and, and could still see a bit when I first got uh, my guide dog. You know, my, I've got some usable vision is the best way to describe it. And so, so by having the guide dog, I, I started to realize over time I wasn't thinking about my vision loss. It was just it just was a thing that happened to be there, and it was a very liberating feeling. Um, and of course, you know, not everyone needs to do something as drastic as getting a guide dog. You should only get a guide dog if you feel you need it. And, and uh, your vision's at a stage where it would be beneficial. But I, I strongly encourage anyone listening to this who uh, might be a little uh, feeling the way I did uh, for much of my life uh, to, to really try in a few situations when they meet some new people uh, who are going to be parts of their lives to, to share, hey, hey, by the way, just, you know, I, I have vision loss. Uh, here's some things I can see. Here's some things I can't see. Um, here's how it impacts my life. But I still can participate fully if you keep these things in mind. And, and having that dialogue just makes, makes those interactions just so much more powerful from the beginning. Well, and that's self-advocacy right there in itself, right? Tammy, can you, can you relate to, to Jack's experience at all? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I just never really wanted to be different. I didn't want to make myself stand out. Um, you know, I certainly didn't want to ask anybody to go out of their way for me. But once I realized and started talking with people, for the most part, it's people don't feel that way. And, and I, I just I didn't realize that for so long, because I would never let my my guard down long enough to figure that out. Um, and, you know, once I realized it's okay. You know, people, um, I find now that I'm much more open about it, they um, respect me more, um, they appreciate. And, you know, I, I don't feel like, I used to sort of have to feel like, I, I, you know, I don't want a label. Um, at this point in my life, I do not have a label. <laughs> and it's just so, it feels so good. When like, once I figured it out, it just felt so good. To just be able to say, yeah, you know, I'm Tammy, and you know, I really don't see very well, but I can see you, and you know, it always generates conversation, and and people are just always so, I can't say everybody is, and some people are a little bit anxious because they don't know what to do. Um, I don't know oh, when they when they deal or talk with somebody who's blind. I don't know what the statistic anymore, but a couple of years ago, I had heard there's probably like less than one percent of the population um, lives with blindness. So some people do become a little bit anxious or nervous. They don't know what to do. Um, they don't know how they, should they do something different or should they talk differently? Should they talk louder maybe? Um, that's always kind of a funny thing for me, but um, I, I just am amazed at how once people realize they're just so helpful and just interested really. And, and I found it, it's a good experience. It feels good to not have to worry about all of that anymore and to actually talk with people and, and actually kind of listen to the responses. They're all different from people, but yeah. I, I feel so much more comfortable with it that those situations than I ever have in my life. And it's a huge weight off my shoulders. Like I said before, I wish I would have done it earlier, but I didn't have that self-confidence and that self-assuredness that I needed to do that, that I have now. Right, right. Um, so Tammy, you had the unique experience of participating in a clinical trial, which is super unique because in a rare disease, it's a very small group that's that's involved. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how self-advocacy played a role in leading up to your enrollment in the trial and then during and then afterwards. Well, keep in mind, um, I, I became a participant in the, the trial that eventually led to that approval of Luxterna back in 2009. Um, and, you know, a lot of things have changed between then and now. But um, prior to that, uh, my husband was my advocate. I was not in a position where I could do research and I could reach out to people and, and search for um, trials or any form of treatment or even really uh, the best retinal specialist. And I didn't have that ability. My husband did all of that for me, uh, which was really painstaking and time consuming. He literally spent um, 
days, hours, years <laughs> he spent looking um, for just something um, associated with my particular mutation that would be helpful. Uh, he Googles things. He started off Googling. Google was a lot different than it is now too. Um, but he would just start Googling articles and, and search for keywords that might lead him to something else. Um, so <laughs> it, it was, there was nothing but self-advocacy. There was really no one out there to help very much. Uh, trials weren't as plentiful as they are now, even though now they're still not super plentiful. They definitely are more so now than they were then. But, you know, he had to really research and spend so much time. I keep saying patience and persistence. Patience and persistence was, were the two words, you know, that described him because he, he just never gave up until uh, he was able to find the child that I actually did participate in. And, and again, he had to advocate for me because the trial initially was just for children. You, they couldn't accept adults. Right. But, you know, Mike was able to talk with doctors and, and they were able to expand uh, or change the protocol. So um, I was allowed to, to be a participant. And there, like I said, there wasn't anybody there, but, um, but him, he was doing it solely on his own. But once we got into the trial, we learned so much more. You know, now it seems like more people are using things like my retina tracker, uh, to help, um, they're linking hopefully with good retinal specialists that may be able to provide some clinical trial information. Uh, and it's always a good idea to get yourself, you know, in contact with some study coordinators, you know, if you find a trial that might be appropriate, you know, so it, the, the advocacy and self-advocacy has changed. There are more people to help you now, but back in the beginning, um, it was tough. It was tough stuff. But I feel like the onus is still on the patient, the, mm -hmm. the civilian to find those trials and, and you know, figure it out is. what's what's out there and what's and what's right for you. So clearly it's important to to continue mm -hmm. to to speak up. Yeah, um, I mean, in, in the beginning, when Mike was looking for me, you know, confidentiality was such an issue, too. And they they really couldn't share a lot of information. It was very hard to self-advocate. But that has changed as, as well, and it is a little easier. But yeah, it's pretty much something you need to seek out yourself, hopefully with the guidance of a good retinal specialist, somebody that you can count on that may have some connections as well. Right. So advocating for yourself can be difficult. Um, Jack, you touched on this already, talking about your professional self and your, and your personal self and how different it is. In, in what aspects of your life do you find it the most challenging? to self-advocate and, and how do you manage those challenge, challenges? And Jack, I'd actually, I want to start with you and I, I'd like you to sort of, it's interesting to me that, <clears throat> excuse me, you work in human resources, so you spend your workday advocating for others basically, right? So talk about how you incorporate that into your, into your personal life and, and what challenges you, you face and how you overcome them. Yeah, and as I kind of already touched on it, um, Work is where I feel most comfortable advocating because I do know all the policies and procedures and legislation about what is required of employers and and I understand how human resources supports people. And so, you know, I've really learned that, uh, you know, large, well established uh, and, and any, you know, smaller or mid sized employer that's a good employer is going to do the right thing to employ uh, people uh, with vision loss and, and is going to do what they can to hire the most qualified person for the job. I know for myself, when I, you know, first uh, started looking for jobs and I was afraid to even ask about something like getting a software like JAWS or Zoom text installed on my work computer. And, you know, as an individual, it's quite expensive to buy JAWS or Zoom text. You know, it's a, around $1,000. I don't know the exact dollar amount to purchase the software on a computer. And so I, I just remember thinking like, oh, man, that's a lot to ask of an employer. But then when you think about it in comparison to the size of, you know, the revenue that the average employer has, or even if you look at it in terms of, you know, your salary, you know, $1,000 is such a small percentage of 
most people's salary that the cost is negligible to the employer um, uh, in terms of actually implementing that accommodation. And so I think it's really just really important to understand what your needs are and and really advocate for exactly what those are, because, you know, most good employers are going to take that time to figure out what that is and, and make it work with you because they want uh, individuals to be as successful as they can in their roles. Um, to go on the other side of the coin for any any younger people on the call, to be completely honest, where I find self-advocacy to be the most challenging is in like dating and personal relationships. Um, it's really hard to be on a first date and you know talk about vision loss and what I can and cannot see and and what that means for a relationship and uh, you know I, I certainly haven't mastered that uh, piece yet but uh, you know as a young person who who you know is is dating it's uh, definitely something that I always feel nervous about uh, when it comes time to share that. Yeah, I can, I can see where that would, uh, you'd want to bring that up early, I would think. Absolutely. Um, Tammy, you have also touched on this, the challenges of, of self-advocacy, but it's interesting to me too, because if, if 211 in Ohio works like it does in Connecticut, that's mm -hmm. an advocacy organization, right? You, you connect people to the help that they need for whatever specific issue they're having. Yes, ma'am. So again, in your professional life and in your personal life, advocacy plays a role. Talk about how you, how you maneuver that. Well, I love to advocate for other people. I love helping people. I love making things better for people. Um, in my current job, I, I find a lot of people in crisis um, and I am very, very uh, capable, willing and able to speak up for people and to get them the services that they need, the program information they might need. Um, I, I just, I, I, I kind of thrive on that. Otherwise I couldn't do the job that drives me crazy a lot of days, <laughs> but I, I am very comfortable with advocating for other people. And it's kind of helped me to realize too, um, I know how I feel when I'm advocating for somebody and, and I get into a situation and I might need some assistance. I might need something different. I, I might need um, some modifications or something. Um, I, I'd like to think that the person that's helping me is taking as much pleasure out of helping me with some small things in life as I do out of helping other people. You know, because I, I find that people like to help. People like to make things better for a lot of people, not everybody. But um, that's been my experience. Um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure um, of how else to say this. No, no, that's, that's perfect. So I'd like to um, sort of move on to talk about outcomes. Have you, through your, your self-advocacy, have you experienced any specific successes or, or outcomes that you can share? Um, Jack, let's start with you. Oh, so many, like, you know, I even, you know, I just started a new job uh, this week and, you know, today even I had a conversation with my manager where she was checking in to see if, you know, uh, are the accommodations that we've got in place uh, sufficient? Is there anything else you need? Uh, and, and, you know, I talked to her about how my onboarding is going and what else I might need uh, and, and how, you know, maybe certain things are going to take me a little bit longer to master at the beginning. But uh, once I've got that, I'll be just as fast, if not faster than others. Um, you know, I find when you self advocate, um, especially in sort of your personal life and out in the community, you have the tendency to meet some really interesting people and form some really unique connections. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell kind of a, an odd story. Um, I'm gonna preface this story by saying I wouldn't encourage what I did in this story uh, exactly, but it's still, it's still a good story. Um, so I was at a uh, celebration event for a scholarship I had won that was funded by one of the big banks in Canada. Um, and so at the event, I met uh, uh, one of the bank's VPs and 
was talking to her about, you know, my vision loss, what challenges that meant. Um, I had my guide dog, Jake, so she was asking questions about him. Um, and I was talking about how, you know, I had taken the the bus uh, to Toronto. Toronto is the, you know, one of the large cities uh, in Canada. And um, how it was my first time actually going to Toronto independently. And I, admit, I briefly off the cuff mentioned that I wasn't a hundred percent sure how to uh, get from the building we were at to the bus terminal to go back and that I'd probably just end up uh, taking a taxi to the bus terminal. The buildings were only like a few blocks apart from each other. Like I easily could have walked it. And she was like, you know what, why don't I uh, help you after the event and uh, I'll make sure you get back to the right place. And so I was like, yeah. And, and so as the event progressed, I met some other people and then I ended up talking with this VP again. She's like, well, you know what I was thinking is I, I'm going the same way on the train. Why don't uh, you come with me on the train and then I'll drive you right to your place the rest of the way. And I was like, this is the part I'm saying I don't recommend uh, hopping in a vehicle with a random stranger. Uh, but I did. And the reason I did and felt comfortable with it is that, you know, she was a VP at a large bank. So I assumed she, you know, it was going to be a safe experience, I guess. But as a result of, you know, me connecting with this person, self-advocating, I a, got to have a really phenomenal conversation with a senior leader in a big uh, financial institution. Um, I got home much quicker than I would have on the bus. Um, and she also got me a summer job while I was in university the next summer uh, because I got to know her through that experience. So, you know, by self-advocating you can have some pretty unique experiences happen i'll say tammy can you top that story <laughs> no i wouldn't even try that one no. uh i mean and again my husband did this a lot of the advocating for me but you know if he hadn't done what he had done for me when it comes to the trial participation um i wouldn't have the vision that i do have now and it is very limited but i have that but um, he had to really work hard to get me to that point. And as an end result, um, you know, I can see, and I have a little bit of vision that I use very, very well. And I am very appreciative of. So that advocacy there got me some vision. And that's uh, um, something that is priceless that you, you cannot put a, a price on. Um, so that's my biggest thing where advocacy, um, advocacy that he did for me, um, that's a result there. And again, that's a, that's a priceless thing there. Um, but my current job, um, I live in a relatively small town. I mean, our population is 25, 26,000 people. We do not have a lot of blind people um, in our community. People don't know a lot about the things, the abilities that, um, blind people have. <laughs> I think we're kind of living back in the maybe 80s, 90s in this area. And a lot of people think, can't see, well, she probably can. There's probably all kinds of things that are wrong. And for some people there are, but I had to do a lot of self-advocating with um, my, my, at that point, potential employers as to, um, you know, I do have these skills. I had to really promote myself. Uh, they're a very, very kind group of people. They wanted to give me a chance, but I could tell through conversations and emails, they were thinking this is not happening. You know, there's no way she's going to be able to navigate her database, you know, to do all the call reporting, to do the, the whole the shebang. How is this going to happen? And um, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of conversation. It took just some teaching and um, introducing them to software um, and explaining how things could work out and how my past experiences, you know, I've been able to make things work for me all my life. And I'm telling you guys, this is going to work. They gave me the shot. Um, I don't think they wanted to. Some of them didn't want to. They were just like, I think they were thinking, please don't waste our time. But they gave me the shot and they trusted me. And I was able to present myself well enough. And, and um, I lived up to my promises. Like I said, I'm here uh two years and two months later i'm still there and um i feel like i'm doing very very well so i'm very grateful um to have this job 
and to have been able to get it on my own merit. And, you know, nobody had to like vouch for me or I did it on my own. It was tough work. They were a tough sell. They really were. It's so awesome though, when you can um, prove them wrong, right? And, and be yeah. very successful at what you do. I mean, they were very, they were very professional about it, but I could tell they just, right. right. And, you know, a few years ago, I would have said, okay, you guys are right. <laughs> You're probably right. I, I'm going to be able to do that. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I learned, I learned how to, I guess, sell myself really. So yeah, that's, those are the two big things, vision and income are my, <laughs> the biggest things I've, I've, I've gotten from self-advocacy and by my husband. Um. Now that we've sort of unpacked how it can be intimidating to become your own advocate, what, what's the advice that you would give to somebody who has a rare disease? Maybe it's visual impairment, maybe it's not, but a rare disease that people aren't familiar with. What, what's your best advice uh, it, when, as they step out and begin their journey into self-advocacy? Tammy, let's start with you. Well, it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning. Um, it, it's tough. You take a chance. When you, when you begin, when you take the chance and you speak up and share something with, with someone or some group of people, um, you know, you're putting yourself at their mercy. You know, you don't know how are they going to respond. Um, is this going to work? You know, am I going to fall on my face here? Or the, how are these people going to react to me? That's a big chance. And you have to be very, very brave to do that. Some people just can't do it. But it is very much worth the chance. Um, because as a general rule, I find people are very open and they're very willing because none of us are purpose, perfect. We all have our thing. Um, and I find people are pretty open and willing to help. Um, I'm not taking it personally if something happens, if you do share some information or you do ask for assistance um, and somebody, for whatever their reason, is not interested in, in what you're sharing, they have their own reasons not to take it personally and, and move on to the next thing. Um, it, it's, it's very hard. Sometimes it can take some practice. It does take a lot of bravery. But again, there's some pretty awesome people out there that take the chance, take the chance. And if it doesn't work out, um, don't take it personally. It will likely be something on the other person's side, you know, that maybe taking that chance didn't work out. Um, there is likely to be a very huge benefit on the other side, if you're willing to take that chance. Um, I think that's so important. That's so important. Jack, what about you? What advice do you have? One piece of advice that I, was given uh, some time ago. And I th I'm going to share it now because I think it applies across all types of rare disease um, is that there's a really big power in making your rare disease relatable and finding a way to make it relatable in really simple terms. And, and by relatable, I mean uh, something that someone can understand uh, uh, no matter uh, how simple you make it and no matter what your experience is. So like I've heard people who are maybe dyslexic, although not necessarily like a rare disease from a genetics perspective, well, um, describe uh, dyslexia as reading, the le reading words that have jumbled letters. Um, I will often describe my vision during the day as always looking at things it's like I'm always looking at things from across the room and at night because I can't see anything at night. All I can see is street lights. I'll say it's like I'm wearing three pairs of sunglasses out at night. Um, and and by, by using simple sentences like that to describe your experience, it helps people understand and not, you know, they're not fully going to understand your experience, but they can at least kind of start to imagine what that is so they can start thinking about, you know, okay, so if this is your experience, how do you approach something like this? Or how can I make something like this better? 
Um, and, and by them starting to ask those questions, it helps them start to feel comfortable uh, including you and, and finding opportunities for you to fully participate in whatever it is you're trying to uh, do. Oh, I think that's such great advice. Thank you so much. Um, so those are all our questions that we created together. We did get some questions submitted in advance. Um, one of them, Tammy has already answered, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, but Tammy, have you had any, and this is off topic, but I know lots of people are dying to know this. So have you had any <laughs> negative effects or side effects since the trial from um, the drug? Absolutely not. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, I, if I hadn't had, you know, inflammation in my eye at the time of the procedures, I would have never known that anything happened to me other than I had um, some vision restoration. Absolutely nothing. Wow. All right. And Jack, this one's for you. Um, how many, you graduated in 20... 2018. 2018. Okay. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is visually impaired and entering either college or the workforce for the first time? So I'll, I'll give two pieces of advice. The first one would be related to the conversation I've had here. And it's really be your own self advocate. Don't be afraid to be bold and ask for what you need. There's going to be barriers. And if you're not bold about your approach in overcoming them, they're going to be uh, much more challenging to overcome the, the sooner you're self-advocating, the more uh, confident you are in self-advocating, the more effective you will be in. The other piece of advice I'd give young people is another piece of advice I was given um, during my time in university. And it was advice that at the time I didn't agree with. And it, some may think it a little controversial. Um, but it's advice that I now realize is such important advice. And that advice was, you know, just because you have a disability, you have a rare disease, you have a visual impairment, et cetera, doesn't mean you need to make your entire life and career about that thing. You actually shouldn't is the advice I was given. And I wholeheartedly agree with that because, um, you know, at the time when I was given that advice, I was so passionate about uh, and still am about inclusion and accessibility and could see myself making that my career. And I remember thinking when I received it, like, you know, how could there be something, you know, that's got to be the most meaningful thing I could do. Um, but I've since realized that there's, yes, there, you can have a pretty significant impact on the society by having your career, having your life be about eliminating barriers, but you're not going to live a full life if you make your entire life be about your vision loss. You're going to let that define you and you're going to get really burnt out. Um, I found so much joy and passion in pursuing a career that I truly find fascinating um, in human resources. I get to uh, solve such fascinating problems every single day. And it's, it's such a joy to be able to um, help people in that regard. That being said, I haven't forgotten about uh, and stopped uh, trying to make the world be a more accessible, inclusive one. I still do that on my volunteer and, and spare time. Um, but I also think that doing that type of work, if it's something you care about, becomes much more effective when you have the credentials, uh, like being able to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this as a human resources professional, uh, that, you know, this is what employers should do to be more inclusive versus I'm saying this is an angry person with a visual impairment, that this is what you should do to improve it. There's much more significant impact that can be made. So to summarize what I just said, because I just rambled, really find something you're passionate about that can be your career outside of making uh, your, your vision loss be your entire identity throughout your career. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have some questions that have come in in the chat. Um, Jack, someone would like you to expand on um, advice for dating and social interactions as a young person in terms of, okay. of advocacy. Yeah, I think I, 
a lot of the same principles I found apply uh, in in things like dating and and personal relationships uh, as as apply to education and and work. The the sooner you um, disclose your vision loss, and the sooner you talk about uh, your ability to, or, or, or how that impacts you in dating, in relationships, uh, the, the more, the better that person is going to be, uh, able to understand and start to relate. Um, I personally for dating, because young people apparently do use apps to date more than anything now, um, in those types of situations, I will, uh, make sure I tell uh, my date that before a first date and sort of in that stage where I'm starting to plan a first date. So there's no surprises in person. I try and put a really positive spin on it. You know, I'll say, you know, I happen to have a vision, a uh, visual impairment. It creates some challenges. Like, you know, when I'm going in for a kiss, I've been known to miss the lips. Um, it comes with some benefits, like some places give me two for one deals, uh, like movie theaters. Um, so there's that. Um, I try and just be very like jokey and like uh, confident about it so that uh, there's that uh, level of comfort to speak to it. So I don't speak to it like my vision loss is something to be ashamed of, something that can't be spoken about because for a relationship to be successful, the person you're dating or even a friend needs to understand how that impacts your life so that, you know, they don't expect you to pick up on a visual cue that you're just not able to see. Um, yeah. Right. I hope that answered the question. Yes. Tammy, did you have um, vision loss when you met Mike or, or did you start to lose your vision after you guys met each other? Um, I did have some vision loss. I mean, I've never had quote unquote normal vision uh, at, at any point in time in my life, but I was much, my vision was much more functional um, when we first met. I've never been able to drive, but you know, I went to a public school, I went to college, you know, I lived on my own, I, I, I lived life with, um, you know, challenges here and there that I just was always to meet. So yeah, or able to meet, but yeah, I, I did have some challenges whenever we met. So yeah, he, but I, I, I told him like right up front and he just looked at me and said, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, soon found out that it was a little more difficult than he thought it was going to be. But yeah, I mean, I was like, I was like, Jack, it was like, you know, put this out there right away because you can't hide it for too long. And, and it is just something um, you got to share. And I learned too, that at that point in time in my life, I was pretty comfortable with my loss because it wasn't that horrible you know it wasn't that bad so I was comfortable with it and so he was comfortable with it and and I give that advice to people all the time too you know find your way to be comfortable with it work it out yourself because if you're comfortable who you're trying to um date or or have a relationship with they can't be comfortable if you're not and well he was I was here we are a long time later <laughs> that's awesome you guys are a great couple. Um, so the last one we have is not really a question. It's more of a comment, but I, I want to share it with you. It says, it's, it's interesting that they both struggled advocating for themselves and then overcame it. And now they both dedicate themselves in their careers and daily work to advocating for others, which I think is really the, the key and the core of of both of you. And we at Sophia Sees Hope are so grateful for your participation in our programs and being our ambassadors because you, that's what you do for us on a, on a regular basis. And um, it, you're just terrific people. And thank you so, so much for taking time to spend with us tonight and, and talk about your experiences and, and your lives. We cannot, we cannot thank you enough. Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do appreciate that. and. Um... You know, we, we, um, I love doing what I can. I, I really do. So you guys are doing great work. Uh, Sophia Sees Hope is an amazing organization. So it's great to have that affiliation with you all. Yeah. And likewise, it's my pleasure to be here and happy to, you know, help uh, in whatever way I can. Thank you. And I'm going to um, send you guys back 
to whatever you had planned for <laughs> the rest of the evening. It's still a gorgeous day out here in Connecticut and the sunset is coming. So enjoy the rest of your night and thank you very much for, thank for participating. You. Thank you. Take care. You too. Good night, everyone.